So welcome to my talk from Spring Native to Spring Boot 3. Thank you for sacrificing your lunch break. Maybe we can get a lunch afterwards. Um, my name is Moritz Halbretter. I work in the Spring Boot team at VMware. So we are doing the, the, the Spring Boot um, I hope you use. And I'm going to talk today about the journey from Spring Native, which was the experimental project, to the Spring Boot 3, which was the general availability release where we supported uh, all the GraalVM native image, image stuff. So first, what's a GraalVM native image? Um, the first thing is um, it essentially takes your Java bytecode and then it transforms it into a native executable binary. This native executable binary that can then run without JVM and it's platform specific. That means you, you, need to, uh, you need to execute it on the machine you build it on, like for example, on, on this Mac or on a Linux. Uh, GraalVM contains a lot more stuff. For example, the Truffle framework where you can run Ruby alongside with Java and stuff like this. But every time I talk about GraalVM in this talk, it's about the native image part because that's what interests us the most. Okay, why would we compile to native? What's, what's the story behind that? The first advantage you get is essentially instant startup and that's the thing you will notice instantly when, when trying that. So instead of taking seconds for startup, like two seconds or one second, it essentially starts in single digit or double digit milliseconds. Um, that's because when the JDK is starting up, it has to load classes, it has to verify bytecode, it has to do all other stuff. And this is just not needed when you do it ahead of time. So if you see AOT on some of the slides, it's ahead of time. So we compile it before and not with the JIT, which normally kicks in. You also have no warm-up phase because the, so the peak performance is available immediately. Normally, how this stuff works is Java starts interpreting your Java bytecode, then it does some profiling then compilers kick in first the C1 compiler and then the optimizing server compiler, the C2 thingy, which then gets you to really high speed, but this takes some time and it consumes some memory. You also get lower resource usage because you don't have a JIT anymore. It's already compiled. You have a smaller garbage collector and they do a lot of more clever stuff in native image to compress this stuff even further down. And I got some numbers to prove that afterwards. Um, what may be surprising is that you also get a reduced attack surface because how this th the thing is working is you, you point the native image to the entry point of your application, which is normally your main method if you're using Spring Boot, and then it starts looking what else is referenced from that main method and then it crawls to your, through your tree what is all used and the rest it just throws away. Okay, so that means it's only, only stuff which you're actually used in your application is in the native image. That means if someone exploits, for example, log for shell, they can't you reflectively call classes which are not included in this native image. And you need to explicitly enable reflection and serialization on the types you want to get that stuff on, which means there is less attack surface and less to exploit. Um, and you also get compact packaging. That means the, s the thingy is smaller because it only includes the stuff you need and you got a smaller binary you can put it in a docker container and the docker com container is much smaller because you don't need the jdk you don't need the jvm you only need the binary you can even statically compile a thing so you don't need even a glibc or something like this you can run it essentially from scratch in a docker image so let's take a look at the use cases we have some use cases where you can where we recommend it. For example, you want to scale to zero. So when there is no load on your system, you scale the, the instances to zero. They don't use any CPU and don't use any memory and they don't create builds for you to pay. If you got low memory and CPU, you, you, um, CPU resources on your server, you can give native uh, image a try because it uses just less memory than the JDK. And function as a service is also good because they start really fast and they don't consume that much memory. When you, for example, talking about the back offices applications, so applications which are only used inside your, your company, for example, um, give it a try because they don't need to handle that high load. If you got microservices, when you have a lot of microservices, you pay a high tax for the, for the JVM essentially because the JVM has some overhead for the JIT and the garbage collection and all that, all that stuff. And this is slower with, uh, is less with the, um, with the native image. Um, if you use agent-based observability, I'm going to talk about that later, uh, you could run into trouble. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. 
And when is the JVM likely better? So for example, if you go to a high traffic website, so the reason for that is that the JIT compiler, which is in those JVMs, it's a marvelous piece of technology and it can do really crazy stuff. And it optimizes your application very, very nicely. Uh, I'm showing some performance numbers. The native image is not on par with the JIT compiler right now, but the GraalVM team is already working on that. If you got, for example, an unsupported dependency, so like I said earlier, some features in GraalVM do not work out of the box. For example, reflection, proxy, serialization, resource loading, and stuff like this. If you got a dependency which does all this and is not supported, there is a, a shim you can put in that some of those libraries are supported. But if you happen to use one which is not supported, you can either do the work to get it supported or you can't use native image. So a little bit of history, because the talk is from Spring Native to Spring Boot 3, so I should maybe talk a little bit about Spring Native. So Spring Native was announced in March of 2021, and um, there was a lot of buy-in from um, teams inside the Spring Engineering team, and they essentially announced it in the Spring Native Beta, and the Spring Native Beta is an experimental project. So you always had to use that stuff at your own risk, and if your data center is on fire, I mean, it's not our fault, it was experimental. But we decided to integrate that stuff into Spring Boot 3. So Spring Boot 3 introduces now official support, so if your data center is on fire, it's still your problem until you, you pay us for commercial support. But um, it's much higher quality. So we don't use hacks which we had in Spring Native. They are now refactored into something better because now we can work with all the portfolio projects, for example, Spring Framework, Spring Security, Spring Data, and stuff like this, that their code is refactored so that it works better on a native image. Okay, so Spring Native, if you're still using that, throw it away, migrate to Spring Boot 3 and use the official support for the native image stuff in there. So I'm going to show you a screen recap of how this stuff is going to work and I did a recording to speed up the native image compiling because it takes some time and I don't want to spend five minutes twiddling my thumbs here in front of this. So I hope those videos are not working here. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, so the first thing you do is you go to start at spring.io, you select whatever build system you want to use. You select at least version 3 of Spring Boot, and then you put in the GraalVM native, suppo native support and the Spring Web. I open it in my IntelliJ, and what you see, there is the build Gradle file, and there is now the build tools, the, the um, native build tools. And there are no more dependencies, like Spring Native had a dependency that's gone now. That's all in the support. You also get a nice help file with links to the Graal native support, and we've written screen pages after screen pages, how that stuff works, what are the drawbacks, and you can read through it if you travel back from Cologne. Okay, there's a lot of stuff in there. There are also commands how to build that image, and we are going to do that now. So I got a small controller. This controller has a logger. This controller has one get mapping. It, if you call it, it just logs. There is a parameter which defaults to Spring.io because it did the record for this for Spring.io and it returns just hello Spring.io. So I'm going to run this now, but first I need to enable the GraalVM distribution. So there are multiple GraalVM distributions, the one from Oracle, the one from Bellsoft. I'm using the Bellsoft here. Nick stands for native image kit from the Bellsoft. And now I got the native image command, which transforms the bytecode into the platform stuff. Now I do a Gradle, a Gradle U boot run, so it's still running on the JVM, just to prove that my code is working on the JVM, okay? I curl it, it says hello Moritz, if I remove the name parameter, it should say hello Spring.io, great. Let's compile it to a native image. So I run Gradle W, native compile, and what it does behind the covers, it's now doing magic, and then it invokes the native image. So this is the native image output, I sped it up three times, so you, we don't have to wait that long. So it first does some crazy stuff, then it finds out what classes are all used, and then it compiles it all into the native executable. And it took like 52 seconds on my machine, or 56 seconds on my, on, on my machine. And what we now got is one file, which is 65 megabytes, and this is all you need to run it. You don't need a JDK anymore. You can just run it. And if you start it, you see it starts on 52 milliseconds, which is quite nice. I curl it, it still works, I can put in my name and it still works. Okay, so this is what you get out of the box. And there we had to do a lot of stuff 
to get this working to that point, and I'm going to um, going to explain more. Tests are also supported, so I wrote, wrote an integration test with a REST template. It starts, expects that this is working, and you can run native test. And what this is doing now, it's compiling your application and putting JUnit in it, and then it compiles it all into a native image and then runs JUnit inside the native image. Okay. So if this stuff is, is working in a native image, you got more confidence that this, this is not blowing up in production. Okay, so you can run your tests inside a native image. And you will see the output of the uh, JUnit report soon. And you see, the demo application test says hello, was successful, it found one test, it started one test, and one test was successful. So this is essentially the JUnit output of the native te uh, tests running inside a native image, which is uh, quite cool. No, we don't want to show that, see that again. Okay. So GraalVM support version. So we started with GraalVM 22.3, which is the older version, and the 23.0, it got released like a week ago, and we support them both, essentially. So um, if you are starting now, you will use the newer version. And this is a little bit complicated because there are a lot of version numbers in there, which is 23.0. The community edition is still called that. But if you're using the Oracle one, which got released under an Oracle pre-license, um, it's named GraalVM for JDK 17 or JDK 20, and there is no 23 anymore. So it's a bit confusing, but I can't change that. What you essentially get is better performance, more compatibility improvements. You got bundles. Bundles are the idea that you got reproducible builds. So you can say native image, bundle me that stuff. Then you can store that bundle somewhere. And from that bundle, you can restore the native image. Okay. You got experimental JMX support, if that's your thing. And the, the biggest news is that previous enterprise-only features are now available as an Oracle Graal VM which is not open source. The community edition is open source, but the Oracle GraalVM thingy is not open source, but they released it under a free license, so you can use it in production. But please let, uh, let your lawyer read the Oracle terms. Um, what you get is a better garbage collector. So by default, it contains the serial garbage collector, but now it has the garbage first garbage collector. You can use the profile guided optimizations, which is a fancy word for this stuff gets even faster. You get compressed object headers and pointers, which are which is a technique to um, further compress the RAM usage of your application, which is quite nice. Um, our commercial offering, so VMware offers a commercial off offering for the spring runtime, so to help you migrate to 2.7 or delay the deadline of, of migration to a Spring Boot or 3 and stuff like this, and this has been updated to the native support too. So we partnered with uh, Bellsoft too, because they are still, they are already giving us support for the JDK. Now it's also for the native image. And if there are, are any fixes that you need as a commercial customer, it will be backported into the, the open source Graal VM so it does not stay behind uh, vendor logins. I talked about libraries and some libraries are supported, some libraries are not supported. Because your Spring Boot application is not only using Spring Boots, you're, for example, using a Tomcat web server by default. You're using the logback logging system. You may use the Postgres connector to connect to Postgres databases. You may use the Kafka connector or Redis connector or something like this. And this is not code written by the Spring team, but it's just third-party dependencies for us. And how that stuff is working is we started talking to the GraalVM team how we should solve that because they have essentially the same problem. And what we did is we did an open source repository which contains a lot of JSON files and those JSON files make those incompatible libraries compatible. So there are essentially three ways to get a library compatible. Rip out all the reflection, proxy serialization and other dynamic features, which is, I think, not feasible. Um, put configuration files in place inside the code base of the library. We We got the H2 maintainers to do that, but we had not that much luck with other projects or store the configuration data outside, which is essentially this repository. So if you find a library and it does not work, open an issue on the GraalVM reachability metadata repository and hope that someone will fix it. Or if you don't have the patience and the knowledge, do it yourself. It's not that hard. There are guidelines, a contribution guide, 
Um, we do mandatory native testing. That means you cannot just dump 500 megabytes of JSON in there. You need to also write a test to prove that this stuff is really working in a native image. And I spent a lot of time writing those stuff so that the third party dependencies you are using with your Spring Boot application are working. And there's a list on the website. This is not the, the whole thing. And there you can see, for example, um, here is uh, logback. Here is the um, connector to Cassandra. Here is some console API. Here is set standard compression. Here is GraphQL, the H2 database, Hazelcast. And there's a lot of stuff in there. So difference between Spring Native and Spring Boot 3. There are now zero substitutions. Substitutions are a feature of GraalVM. If there is code inside a library which is not compatible with the GraalVM, so with the native image, you can essentially substitute it with other code. But this code is only run when running in a native image, which means that the code you can read in your repository is not the code which is executed in production, which is maybe not a good idea, and you can not debug that stuff, so our guideline was to use zero substitutions. The stuff you use, the stuff the maintainers wrote, is the stuff which is running in production. One big issue with the substitution is, if you, for example, substitute a method, and they fix a CVE in that method, but we don't fix it in our substitution, you now got a CVE, which no system will ever report because they don't know about those substitutions. Uh, that's one big problem you run into. So there are no substitutions in our code. Fix the upstream libraries instead if they are not um, compatible. We have no explicit build time initialization. So if in, in Java, it's a lazy language. So if you load a class, the class is initialized when it's loaded. So it calculates the static final fields and stuff like this. GraalVM takes another approach to get even faster startup. Some classes are initialized while you're building that application. So for example, private static final int something equals one could be initialized at build time. And then you take a snapshot of this class in the heap and store the heap inside the native image and then just mem copy it essentially. And then this is really fast. But the problem with that it is that this is um, viral end. So if you build time in it one class and this has a reference to another class, this is also build time in it. And now think about you got a lot of private static final logger something, which initializes then the complete logging system at build time, which means it reads your logback.xml file at build time, and then you're stuck and you can't change logger levels at runtime anymore. So that's the big problem with build time initialization. So we switched that off. No build time initialization, it behaves like the Java thing. And there is the runtime hints API, which I'm going to show in the next video. Um, those libraries here contain a lot of JSON, and I showed the JSON afterwards, and we don't like fiddling with the JSON stuff. We want to program it with Java because then we can test it. So there is a runtime hints API in Spring Framework now, which you can use to register, for example, enable reflection on something or include another message bundle, which we're going to see. So here I got a demo about how to migrate the Pet Clinic project, which is our showcase application, to a native image. It's already on Spring Boot 3, so you're not going to see the Spring Boot 2.7 to Spring Boot, Spring Boot 3 migration. It's, it's already on, on, on 3. So let's put it in full screen. Thank you, browser. OK. The first thing we're going to do is to include the native Build Tools plugin. The Native Build Tools plugin is a plugin from Oracle, which essentially kickstarts the native image for you. So you don't have to do it on your own, and it downloads all the JSON stuff. There is a message resource bundle, and normally we find out about stuff which we can to register it, but this is not really default, so you have to register it yourself. So you implement a class which Im implements runtime hints registrar, and this is the runtime hints API I was talking about. And here you can say hints dot, and then you can register resources, JNIs, proxies, reflection, and serialization. We are going to do that for resources. We register the resource bundle. It's called message slash messages, I think, or messages slash messages. And now GraalVM knows about the thing and includes it inside the native image. Otherwise, it would not include it. And then you have to activate the stuff via add import runtime hints. And now 
Gravi now we generate JSON for that, which we automatically feed into native image. There is also view rendering, which uses classes which are not exposed via a controller method. You need to register them for reflection because the templating engine is using reflection under the hood. Okay, so you essentially do register for reflection for binding and specify all the, re the reflection classes. And then you can run it. There was a um, Maven build, build uh, native image thingy. And now you can see it's starting. There was a cut, so it, it's not really that fast. Then it created the image. And you can see it took like one minute and 16 seconds on a really powerful machine. And now we can run it. And normally it takes like four seconds to start or something like this. And now it starts in 156 milliseconds, which is quite nice. To prove that it works, you can just click through it and it's still doing what it's doing. Okay, so it's not that hard to migrate your stuff to, to native. Mm, but if you're using unsupported libraries, which will maybe the case, that's the biggest problem. But if you're sticking to the beaten path by Spring Boot, it's normally going to work. Okay, so that was essentially the marketing for the GraalVM stuff. Now we are going to take a look at the under the covers. How does that stuff is technically really implemented? There is, uh, There are the building pieces which we need to get all that stuff working. There is the native image compiler, which does the um, bytecode to native compilation. There is the native build tools, which is the Gradle and the Maven plugin, which kickstarts this native image and downloads the uh, JSON files for third party dependencies and stuff like this. And there is this reachability metadata, which um, stores the JSON files for third party libraries. If you're using build packs, and you really should, if, you use, if you're creating container images, they got now support for the native image stuff too. And then we start at the bottom of the layer, so in framework. There is an AOT transformation engine. So I said GraalVM does not like proxies and reflection and other dynamic features. Well, it turns out that Spring Framework is built on a lot of reflection and a lot of proxies. So what are we going to do for that? The first thing we tried is register a lot of hints to make this stuff working. But what happened is we got a really big runtime size. And we did not want to do this. So there is now an AOT transformation engine which looks at your beans and then writes Java code to create those beans. And you will see that, for example, the dependency injection, which we normally do by reflection, is now rewritten into Java code. This Java code gets compiled and then gets fed into the native image. And that's how, for example, dependency injection works. This is the AOT transformation engine. It has a plug-in system where you can plug into this transformation engine if you want to do custom stuff. Normally you won't do this, but the portfolio projects, for example, Spring Data or Spring Security, they need some transformations. For example, the funny find by name something from Spring Data, which translates then into Hibernate queries, are using those, Hibernate tra uh, are using those IoT transformations to get this stuff working. And if we can't rewrite it to code or it's too too much effort, we just register um, JSON hints via the runtime hints API. And then Spring Boot comes and bundles all together. So what we have is the, the boot plugin, and the boot plugin got clever, more clever. It now detects that you are using the, um, the native build tools plugin, and then it automatically kickstart this transformation engine. This creates the source code, we compile it, fed it into the native image compiler, and everything works. And you see the, a lot of um, native documentation, which we also written, which lives in Spring Boot. There was a question, yeah. Uh, will you, will you support IoT transformation Very good question. I'm going to answer that on that slide. <laughs> so. Um, when your app is compiled, normally it, compil it, it contains the, con the compiled sources and the resources. Okay? Now the AOT stuff kicks in and it generates more sources and it sometimes generates classes which has no source representation. For example, when you're doing CGLib proxies, CGLib proxies are only 
available at runtime because normally they are created at runtime. But what we do is when we detect that a ggLib proxy is created, we do crazy class loader magic to get the bytecode for that and then write it to disk and then fed it back to native image and now it's got compiled. Okay, so when this AOT stuff is done, you have your compiled sources. We don't touch it because we don't want to be at fault if that stuff breaks in production. Your sources, we don't touch them. Our sources, or our sources, so the sources generated by the AOT transformation engine, some classes, and native image configuration to make it all work. And now you have two ways. The first way is what I, what I shown, the native image compile, which produces a native binary, which uses this code path. And then there is the boot jar, which contains, uh, which which produces the jar file. But now the jar file contains all of this, so it it contains a code path which eliminated all reflection on for dependency injection, and replace it with code. And now you can decide when starting up that code, what code uh, this jar, what code path you want to use. Okay, so this jar can run in normal mode or it can run in AOT mode, but on a JVM. Okay, I'm going to show that. Let's take a look under the covers, how that really works in practice and looks in an IDE. So what I have here is an application, a main method, a service interface, which just can say hello with a given name, a controller, which dependency injects the service, and if you call the get mapping, it calls the service and returns the output. This is the default implementation of the service, annotated with add service. And what it does is, if you call the hello method, it goes to the configuration file and reads a greeting from it. And this greeting configuration file is dependency injected. And here you see the greeting is hello with the prefix application my service hello. So let's compile that stuff. And I'm not going to compile it to native, I'm just compiling it the normal way. Okay, this runs on a JVM and it produces a jar file. You will see because it's not that hard. What you can see here is process AOT. That's a new task. Why is your spring banner popping up in the build process? And this is the, the AOT transformation engine. What it does is it takes a look at your beans and then generates code. And for that, we have to bootstrap your application to a certain point. So it will not do any... Um, it will not do any uh, database connections or other stuff but it bootstraps the, the context so that we know which beans are available and then we see how those beans can be constructed by Java code and I'm going to show the Java code now. So here are classes, resources and sources and now get, let's take a look at what is in the resources. There is this native image properties file which essentially says this is the starting point of our application. Okay, This just points back to this class and from there the native image sp spiders through all the classes. This is a lot of JSON for to get reflection working. Okay, There's still a lot of reflection going on. We can't eliminate all and this is a lot of it. There are also some resources included by default, for example the application.properties because we guessed you want to use your application config file or the YAML file or the YAML file with an A. Now take a look at the sources. There is an application context initializer. And the application context initializer is a thingy from framework and what it does is it initializes your context, who would have guessed. So this creates all the beans in your context. And now we can take a look at this underscore underscore methods or classes and see what they contain. A lot of code. It even has javadoc, so we generate javadoc, how awesome is that? You can debug that stuff, you can put a breakpoint in it if you want. A lot of a lot of beans, and there are your beans. This is the demo application, this is the controller, this is the default service, and the properties which you declared is also in there. Let's take a look how to get that controller. So we tell Spring, okay, this is a bean, this type is my controller, if you want an instance, you call this method. And this method, what it does is, it first, you see the new call in there? For that it needs an argument, because the controller, controller needs a my service as an argument for the constructor. So we get it from the beans and then put it just in there, but with a new statement, okay? No new, in, new constructor call with reflection. Now take a look, where is the service coming from? Okay, a definition for that service, if you want an instance, call this method, this method, calls new default my service and it needs the configuration properties for that. Okay, so we're going to ask the container for that, but no reflection involved. 
just some hash map lookups. So where's the properties thingy? There are some bean definitions and they are mirroring your package structure. And here is the my, my service configuration properties. Okay? And this is just called with new because it has not any dependencies. And this is the code which makes it all work. It now does not use any reflection anymore for dependency injection. There is the one for your main application, because the main application is a configuration file. And here you can see Spring IO something application, and there are a lot of dollar signs and zglibs in there. And there is no source code for that, because this is a zglib proxy, which I then decompiled. And now you can see how zglib is, compiled under, uh, is working under the hood. So we support proxies too. The same thing is done for your tests, because the tests need to run in an native image too. And you want to use add Spring Boot test on your tests. And this is the stuff which makes it work. We can now run it. Okay, it starts up. Very cool. And now we enable the AOT mode. Spring.aot.enabled equals true. So now it's still running on a JVM, but now it uses the generated code which I've just shown on a JVM. Okay, so you can opt into this AOT processed application. If you're using native image, this is mandatory. It will always use the AOT code path, but if you're using it on a JVM, you can use the AOT code pa path, and it gives some minor performance benefits, which I'm going to show. Okay. Um, we got a lot of questions if profiles are possible, because we said somewhere that profiles are not supported, which is not correct. We are supporting profiles, but when you are compiling that stuff to IoT, we take a look at your beans, okay? And some profiles are changing beans, okay? And what this stuff is doing, you can enable a profile at build time, and then all beans and that profile are always active, okay? You can't switch them off anymore. That's the trade-off what, what we did by generating that code. There are no ifs in there, so we don't support profile stuff. Okay, but it, it is possible and I'm going to show how that works. I've, read, I've written documentation for that. So there is a service which can say hello. There is one implementation, the service A, and there is another implementation, the service B. They just say hello from A and hello from B, and they are hidden behind profile A and profile B. There is a command line runner which gets executed when the application is started up. It uses this service and just calls the hello method. And what we expect is if you run it in profile A, it returns hello from a, and if we run it at B, we expect it hello from B. Let's build it. Let's run it. And boom, it explodes, because I did not have specified any profile, so there is no default implementation. But if I do a profile, then it runs A, and now it, and then it runs B if I run it with profile B. Okay, S so far so cool. Now run it in AOT mode with profile and it still says, yeah, well, it blows up. With B, it blows up too. So the problem is, what we did is, we built it without a profile. And now, the, 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 all the beans without the profile stuff are encoded inside the Java code, which is then get compiled, so you can't switch them off uh, on anymore. But I've written documentation about how to get profiles working when working with the IoT stuff and the native image, and you essentially have to either copy 500 kilobytes of XML or some obscure Gradle syntax stuff. And what it essentially does is, when the process IoT is run, please use the profile A. And this will bake all, all beans with the profile A into the application, and then you can't switch them off anymore. They're active always. Okay, you see it in the build output, and now I can run it. With profile A, it now works. With profile B, it still works, but it's A. And if, you, if I remove the profile completely, it's still A. Because now you can't switch it off anymore, okay? You essentially fix the bean configuration. That's the trade-off behind all that AOT stuff. If I do a native compile, it's the same, okay? So because the native stuff builds on top of the AOT engine, you get the same trade-offs. It's compiling, you can run it with profile A, it works. With profile B, it still works, but it's using A. And if you remove it, it's, you still get profile A. 
Okay, that's how profiles are working. We have two ways of building nati native executables. The first one is the native build tools, with, uh, which I've shown. It's the plugin, the Gradle plugin. So it started with a collaboration between Spring and the GraalVM team, and we had we had really great collaboration with the GraalVM team. We have weekly meetings where we discuss stuff. It's, it's really awesome. And the Micronaut team has joined too, so they, they are using that too. What you get is you can compile and your test your application, but it requires a local GraalVM installation, either the one from Oracle or the one from Bellsoft, whatever you want. And what it does is it produces an native executable. So if you run it on a Linux x64, you get an executable which only runs on Linux x64. If you compile it on, for example, a Windows x64, it only runs on a Windows x64. Okay, so your deployment machine must have the same architecture like the thing you build it on. But I guess all your CI servers are running on Linux and they are creating container images for Linux. So that's usually no problem. The other way is build packs. So if you are building Docker container images, take a look at the build pack stuff. It's really awesome because it cre creates optimized Docker containers without any knowledge of you. Just run it and you get your Docker container. This also works with the native image. It does require Docker, but no GraalVM installation because it will just pull whatever it needs. And it produces a Linux container image. X64 is supported. If you want to run it on M1 or M2 Max, you will run into troubles. But there is a workaround. Um, Dashaun has a builder which works on ARM machines too. And you can just use that. Data points. So the startup time. Um, this is a Kotlin um, functional method. And you see the startup time on native image is like 32 milliseconds on JVM with AOT mode. It's two seconds in the best case. But if you're using small machines, like with a, a quarter of a CPU and some 512 megabytes of memory, you see that the JVM thingy here takes 21 seconds to start and the AOT mode, so the not reflection-based dependency injection, takes 16 seconds, okay? So you got a little bit of performance benefit. Um, the, the native image is um, always starting quite fast. And the same for this is the Spring, uh, Spring Pet Clinic, but in Kotlin. With that startup, you can start to scale to zero your cloud stuff because it just starts in 32 milliseconds. Why not just kill the container if it got no load? And if someone requests the first request, start up the container. If it started in 32 milliseconds, I mean, why not? And the cool thing is when, when this line reaches zero, you are not paying for any resources in the cloud. And that's the cool thing about this scale to zero stuff. And this is now possible with the GraalVM native image. That's, that's quite nice. Another performance numbers, but those are the old numbers. And I've screenshotted the new numbers from the GraalVM team. So GraalVM did those benchmarks. And what you see here, the startup Spring Boot 3 pet clinic takes on the JVM seven seconds on a community edition for the uh, 410 milliseconds and on the enterprise edition essentially which you can use for free uh, um, 200 milliseconds so it's quite a performance difference between the, those two the memory footprint if you use it on the jvm it uses like one one dot um, eight gigabytes of memory here it only uses 900 megabytes with the community edition and this is even less with 700 megabytes so you can run more stuff on your server or you can just buy smaller servers which means you get a smaller bill because your machines are smaller, which is another big benefit of this native image stuff. The peak throughput, like I said, the JVM is damn hard to beat. This is the JVM version. It's really fast. The community edition is like half of that. The enterprise edition with profile guided optimizations, so with um, more optimizations on top of it, is catching up, but they still have something a little bit to do. But Peak throughput is not everything. This is the throughput over the whole lifetime. And you see, this thingy here just consumes more resources, for example, for garbage collection and stuff like this. So the, the CE native image is quite on par. And if you're using the enterprise native image, which uses a lot less resources, just has more resources available for handling business code instead of running garbage collection and stuff like this, it's, it's, it's really on top of that. So the performance numbers from this enterprise edition are quite nice. Let's quickly talk about observability. There are usually 
two ways of adding observability. The first one is using JVM, a JVM agents. For example, if you're using the, the Azure App Insights or what, whatever the thing is called, or uh, Datadog, they usually give you a JVM agent, which you then attach to your JVM. It does some bytecode transformation, puts the probes inside your JDBC connector so that you get nice overviews and metrics. But the problem is, it works on bytecode. The native image does not know the concept of bytecode because bytecode is native image code. So agents which transform bytecodes are not going to work on your native image. What you can do is you can specify the agent at build time, so when you're building your application, and then it transforms the bytecode when building the native image. But the problem with that is you fixed your configuration. Okay, So the backend, which you gave to the agent to report to, is now baked in and you can't switch it off anymore. And the other solution, which we did in the spring project, is use micrometer tracing. Micrometer tracing does not use an agent. You, you have essentially observations starting and stopping going on in the code, you, so you really see that stuff. And the upside is that it works completely in native spring because it's a, just a first-class citizen. And you can export to the same backends because it can speak Brave and it can speak open telemetry. so this should be all covered. The actuator is working in a native image too, so this is a screenshot from, I called the Prometheus endpoint from a native image and you get all the metrics and it's working like you expect. And the tracing stuff is too, so this is a, um, a screenshot from the Wavefront, the VMware Tanzu tracing thingy, and you can see here um, you get your trace and you get the spans with text attached, so everything is working like you expect, even in a native image without any agents. And with that, in the future, we are still working on that stuff, so it's not done. There are a lot more imp um, improvements. And we continue to follow and shape the GraalVM evolution to, together with the Oracle and the other teams, and we hope it will get even better than what I've shown already. And with that, thank you very much. If you want to contact me, scan this QR code. All my links are there, and I have some time for questions, so I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> totally steamrolled. <laughs> yeah. Nope. So the question was, do we still have no support for Log4j2? The problem with Log4j2 is that they are using a programming construct which is not supported on the Graal VM, and we opened an issue on the Log4j bug tracker, but they have still not fixed it, so you don't get Log4j2. That's the sad story. Okay, cool. So I'm going to grab uh, lunch. If you want to join me, feel free. We can talk about native stuff, we can talk about boot stuff, or we can talk about your cat. I don't care. If you want to join me, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. <coughs>